Um, I'd like to now uh, open up for questions. Um, we will. Uh, I'd ask that um, delegates who um, do wish to ask a question provide their name um, and the uh, and the organisation you represent, uh, if any, uh, when you're asking questions. Um, are there any questions at this point? Thank you. Uh, Rod Keenan, University of Melbourne. Um, question for Peter Holding. Uh, so I guess a lot of the history with Australian farming has been based on, or over recent years, high input systems that are relatively uh, simple in um, their composition just a few, um, a few commodities. I've been reading a lot about regenerative agriculture recently where people are arguing we should have much more diverse systems at a lower input, uh, probably not realising the payoff when conditions are good, but enable farmers to survive um, through these more challenging conditions that you're referring to. So um, what's your view on, um, on lower input more diverse, perhaps um, native species based uh, farming systems? Um, yes, well, I'm not averse to that proposal. We're trying to do it ourselves. Um, through the 80s, we were extremely high input farming. Uh, we used to use 120 kilos of MAP. We probably use about 60 or 70 now as a, a rule of thumb. Uh, what I've found is that um, probably at least a third of your, your end yield, um, now this will sound a bit odd, but about a third of the yield is driven by the rainfall that falls. Uh, you do have to make up, you do have to do fertiliser budgets and make up for what you use. The other thing we're doing is trying to be flexible and, and we're moving away. We were cropping about 85, 90% of the farm, cut back sheep considerably. Although again, it's interesting when you go to grazing cereals and grazing canolas, you can run your sheep pretty much the same as you were before. So we're trying to get double use out of the crops. Um, if you then run into a dry year, just graze them out. So it's all sort of, you know, it really is about being flexible. Uh, costs are an absolute uh, must to be controlled. Uh, barley, for argument's sake, is a simpler crop to put in than wheat and it doesn't require as, um, as much fertiliser, which is one of the biggest costs. So, yeah, we're, we're definitely going down that track. I'd go organic. We're trying to use... Um, I haven't used uh, insecticides on our farm for a long time, uh, and I don't think it makes that much difference. What I've found there is that if you... Uh, we, we put a lot of um, trees and shrubs and all that sort of stuff back in, but if you can get the balance back right, and not send yourself broke at the same time, uh, it is possible to cut back on some of these things. But it's very, very difficult. I was talking to the guy at uh, Juni um, um, Organic Wheat makes licorice, and he grows uh, organic wheat on his own farm. But as he pointed out, he gets, uh, he gets $500 a tonne for organic wheat. We get about $250 a tonne, so you think that's great, but he doesn't get enough to make it possible. If he wasn't then able to turn that ton of organic wheat into organic licorice and get five thousand dollars a ton for it, he wouldn't be able to do it. So, yes, there's there's niche markets in all of this stuff. Um, pretty much what we people were talking about at the conference early, to, you know, this morning. Um, but it's a very complicated thing, and economics comes into it an awful lot. I, I suspect one of the big issues with farming is to try and build up. Um, sufficient farm management deposits and those sort of cash reserves. You've got to have, you've got to have some ability to manoeuvre. Uh, many of the farmers that are successful today, myself included, have got very successful wives doing uh, uh, things that bring in money. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gary Goldberg from Rural Financial Counselling Services. Uh, my question is really for Tom about the weather derivatives. 
is that is that physically being traded at the moment? How's it being managed? Um, you know, where do you trade it? Yeah, thank you. So um, they are currently commercially available. There's a um, particular business um, they're based in southern Australia that, that offer these contracts. I don't. I'm, I don't think they're fully available across the whole country, but certainly in Victoria and southern bit of New South Wales, you can enter into a contract with this particular company, and they will. Um, you basically pick a, a a grid location or you know a, a Latin along that's as, as close to you as possible, um, and then you say right over that particular point or the interpolated data from the weather bureau that is available at that point. You say, um, yep, I would I'd like to en enter a contract for. Say you're concerned about rainfall during winter, you might say, okay, if it's less than you know 200 mils, then um, there'll be a payout, and it's sort of there's a you, you're basically agreeing to a certain amount of payout in exchange for you know paying the the price of the contract. So it's it's a lot like managing price risk using a derivative. Thanks. Up towards the back. Uh, yeah, Matt Dogloose at Mercado, um, and this is for you as well, Tom, just regarding the um, price risk management. Um, there have been, for some time now, uh, quite a few tools locally that can be used to manage price risk, particularly for wool, but then also most recently last year for livestock prices in sheep and cattle and also for grains. Um, it, but there's been a fairly small amount of take-up um, in these products, uh, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts as to why uh, the take-up is so small. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a good question. Um, and I think we, we see that a bit similar even in the grains industry where there's been price risk management tools around for a long time, but not everyone uses them. And I, I was talking to one um, guy a while ago who, who was running quite a large corporate agriculture business, and he said that he, even they had stopped using them because it sort of felt like taking the risk twice, where you're already taking all the risk to produce the thing, to then go entering into a contract uh, it says you promise to deliver X tons of wheat or lambs or whatever it is on a particular date at a particular price. If you get a bad season and you can't deliver that, then you've also got to wear the cost of the contract. So I, I, I think part of it is about the perception that they're not necessarily risk reducing, that they can actually cause you to take more risk. And the other side of it, I, I think, is an education thing where um, perhaps not everyone feels like they, they have the, um, the background and the, the knowledge they would need to be making smart moves with those sort of contracts. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know really if that's something that's going to be taken up. I, I know there's, there's been various things in the past where these contracts have been available and then fallen away because of a, a, a lack of interest. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a, I think there's, there's some sort of barriers there that... Um, some promotion and education will help to some extent, but I think there's also just the fact that, yeah, people need to be aware that they're not necessarily always risk reducing in all cases. Could I add something to that? Sure. Um, we've traded many different types of things from forward contracts to Chicago exchange stuff and derivatives. Most of it, we feel, up to date, has transferred the production risk to the producer and not um, not helped us out a great deal. Um, but there are some new products coming and I don't exactly know. This year there's a product by the group we live, work with at home where you'll be able to um, do an area contract on your crop but it'll, it'll guarantee uh, your um, costs but still leave open the potential for upside if you um, if, if it's a good year, uh, so you're not you're not actually contracting the uh, the actual tonnage at a price. Now I don't know how they're doing it, but they're pro I know you've got to be you've got to be part of their uh, consultancy um, program, and you've got to have their weather little weather station thing put in your paddock. Uh, that allows them to uh, run APSM models and you know production models. And I suspect maybe they're doing some of this weather derivative stuff um, because they will charge you $20 a ton to do it. But it doesn't seem like too, big a pro uh, too bad a product, but it's only just coming out now. 
Thanks, Peter. Um, I've got a question for Stephen, if that's okay. Um, Stephen, your presentation demonstrated uh, quite starkly, I think, uh, just how complex the um, operating environment uh, is uh, in agriculture and becoming increasingly more complex. Uh, given the potential um, influence uh, that more extreme frost events will have um, uh, on production decisions, particularly in the cropping sector, are you aware of any tools that are being developed that will assist directly farmers in that decision-making process? Oh, thank, thanks for the question, Sally. Um, I think probably in terms of the tools that are available, we probably need to think about the the sort of response that can occur and and I think there's two sets of responses there's the sort of proactive response um, prior to if you're a, a growing a crop so there, there's potentially things that you can do at the beginning of the season that, that would actually minimize your risk and then there are things that you can do post event um, that that then can actually quantify the the level of damage um, so in terms of the, the sort of proactive um, response, obviously as we move into a, um, an area where, where, well sorry, as we move into sort of a period where the seasonal forecasts are becoming more accurate, mm -hmm. we can get a, a, a more accurate sense of what the, the risk might be so we can start to make some decisions about time of planting, about varieties, etc. In terms of what we can do sort of post-event, um, we, we're actually doing some work um, which is funded by the National Frost Initiative uh, under GRDC's sort of remit, which is looking at how we can equip farmers with some tools to, to do some more rapid assessment uh, when these events actually occur. So it's using um, sort of hyperspectral, different types of cameras that you can mount onto UAVs and rather than having to cross the whole of your farm and, and getting a sense of the sort of damage from a particular event, um, these technologies will allow you to do a much more rapid assessment. And then there's interventions or decisions that you can make about, do you act, is it worthwhile harvesting? Um, is it worthwhile putting on additional nitrogen or other, other inputs? Um, so those are the things that we're, we're working on at the moment. Um, whether there's, there's things operationally available, um, certainly there are some maps, some high resolution maps which give people a better indication of the extent of the frosts. Um, but I'm not aware of things that are translating that then into actual crop damage. Right. Okay. As we know, uptake is all important. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. Uh, Peter, I was just wondering uh, to what extent do you take up the various insurances that uh, Tom talked about and, and perhaps your use of uh, the Bureau uh, website? Um, well, I was just talking to Peter before the talk started. I don't use the multi-peril insurance. Um, it's too expensive for the for the small margins that we're trying to squeeze out of cropping at the moment. Um, but I do use extensively the uh, long range forecasts. Uh, the seven, nought to seven day forecasts um, I use religiously for sowing, spraying, all that sort of stuff. Like that's just second nature, You'd, you wouldn't do it without it. Harvesting, you're forever using radars and forecasts trying to avoid uh, like we've got country at Cootamundra or 40, 40 kilometres apart and so we'll send trucks to different spots depending on where it might be raining and the rain tends to come in known strips. I've got a neighbour and if he gets wet I don't and if I get wet he doesn't so <laughs> we have a little argument over that but yeah I'm always using uh, the, the Bureau's stuff. Um, I'd like to see multi-peril come in, but if we look at where that's come from, it doesn't even work in America. If they took the subsidies away from paying for it, it wouldn't work over there either. So, you know, it's just another, it's just another sort of, um, well, another form of subsidy for them, I think. Um, I'm rather excited about this new um, marketing product, though, for, 
for locking in a price and a, and a yield because it doesn't seem that expensive. I'm not entirely sure how the company, I don't know if you're allowed to say companies or not, but I, I won't, but um, I'm not sure how they're covering themselves because uh, they must be taking some sort of um, futures derivative or something to back to cover the, the, the loss because they wouldn't be able to cover it otherwise. So that's, that's a possibility. Um, yeah, we use all sorts of, um, yeah, you know, I use uh, yield profit, which is another, which is based on the CSIRO APSA model about um, growth of crops. So it'll tell you day to day uh, how much rain you've got, what its potential yield is, what the nitrogen, you know, if you put 100 kilos of nitrogen on, how much that's likely to give you a benefit, all sorts of things. So there's all sorts of models out there. Um, and that was the thing when I was asked to come here and talk about adaption as if it was something new. I don't know any farmer that's not adapting flat out because if they're not, they're gone. They would have gone in the last 20 years. Uh, I find it rather... Um, how will I describe this? The business the other day where they gave $100 million to Macquarie Bank to set up farms to demonstrate adaption to farmers. I'd like to know who signed off on that because uh, they're seriously questionable. But anyway, I'm going to... Thanks, Peter. Um, we've got time probably for one or two more. Thanks. Uh, David McInnes from Steadfast. Uh, we're uh, a group looking after general insurance brokers and my role is to look after the rural and regional brokers in Australia. So we'd love to have a multi-barrel crop insurance product but to your point Peter, the only place in the world it does work is where there's really heavy government subsidy. But Tom, to one of the things that you talked about um, was insuring for the profits or the potential profits uh, of, the, of the harvest. Um, to make it affordable if we're able to insure for the production costs and other fixed costs, that's obviously going to reduce the overall payouts. Can you talk to us about the um, any research you've done about insuring the profits as opposed to those costs um, and what you might think that might do to the take up? Yeah, so we, we haven't done any um, particular research on that exact topic, but sort of as a, a, as a general rule, obviously the, the, the greater the potential payout, um, the greater the premium ha has to be to cover that. So there are products available now, multi peril products available now, where you can insure up to any value that, that you choose. So if you decide my uh, variable costs that I absolutely have to be able to have in my pocket to plant the crop next year, say that's $400,000, you can insure just that much, even if your expected profit is $2 million. So that flexibility already e exists in the market I, I think what um, and the take up of, of those products is, is still quite low and uh, I think the, the, the calculation people are making is just they, they look at the costs and the benefits and they decide that you know it's better to run a few sheep or to use some other tool to, to, to manage the risk that they're facing. So I, I think with those insurance products there's a, they, they are covering a wide range of perils and it's just they're, they're not like a lot of other in, in insurance products that you know cover things that occur very rarely so um, I, I think there'll be ongoing in innovation I think that the um, the current sort of insurance models are, are based very much on you have to assess each individual farm um, and that's what Peter was talking about you know they have a weather station on your farm to make sure they know exactly what's happened with the season and to try and control for that moral hazard and those other issues that you well know ar arise with all sorts of insurance um, but you could also imagine that these index kind of products could start to fill that gap where um, if you're really worried about making back just enough to cover your costs, you could ha have an index product that you're only worried about the worst 10% of years or the worst 20% of years. So you, you, you're not paying all that much because it's not covering you all that much of the time. But when those diabolical years come along, you've, you've got some protection. So. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you. 
Uh, my name's Andrew Clark. I actually look after agribusiness for the National Bank, so I'll put it out there right at the start. I want to make a couple of comments here um, about multi-parallel crop insurance because as a bank we're really interested in any risk mitigation that can help our customers. I think there seems to be a few things that are missing in, in your calculations here. This is a conversation we have a lot with a lot of customers. And we've got a lot of customers that turn around and say, at the moment we buy our insurance when we pay for our land. So when we're buying our land, we're buying water. Um, yep, we're talking about dry land farming. So this idea of covering costs, when you actually look at the production history of a lot of the farmers, turning around having a look at the number of years in any 10 year period where they don't cover their base costs, in many cases, is quite low. So that's so you've got to look at the psychology of the farmer that, that you're actually talking, or the business owner, let's call them business owners because that's what they are. So you then start to have a look at Western Australia and you're looking at the low rainfall areas. Now that that's where your, your frost risk is higher and, and we've got issues there. It's also where your dry season earlier finishes are happening and this is the struggle that you've got with, with your multi-peril crop products in that those are the guys that are going to be more likely to call upon them. And they're more likely to be the same businesses that will call on them year on year. So you actually got a, uh, a geographical risk or you know, where you've got a lot more customers in the one areas. And the areas where you know, if you're an insurer, you want to be taken up. At this particular point in time, a lot of the customers don't see the value in it. So there's a lot more to it than just looking at this coverage of cost. And I think it's important that when you're having a look, you need to talk to a lot of the farmers that are actually taking up these products and seeing what the psychology is behind their decision making. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, probably got time for one quick, one more quick question, um, if anybody's. Well, no, we've exhausted that. Okay, well, so um, just up to me now to once again um, thank all of our presenters for a very interesting session and to thank, thank you all for attending today's session. Uh, we'll now break for afternoon tea um, and the final sessions for today begin at 4pm. Thank you very much. <laughs>